The Impact Nation. I like that. I like that. Anyone in here going, yep, I'm in? Yeah, the Impact Nation. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker this morning comes to us from London, New York, and any one of the various cities around the world that she's been to in the last 36 hours. Um, she is the head of sustainability at the World Economic Forum. Um, she's a fellow there. Um, an incredible energy ball of the belief in what it is that we're trying to do in this room today. I'd like you to put your hands together and welcome Catherine Brown. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine's going to talk to us this morning about the SDGs, sustainability, and how this whole picture starts to come together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, John. And actually, thank you for mentioning that I have been in a number of time zones in the last 36 hours. So do forgive me for reading a little bit more than I would, because I don't know what time it is or where I really am. So uh, good morning. Shalom. This is actually my first visit ever to Tel Aviv, to Israel, in fact. I also had the great pleasure of being in Ramallah yesterday, also a first. Uh, many firsts in the past few days. And I think for many of you as well, this is probably a first, a conversation that you're just starting to have here. So thank you for the organizers, obviously, for Amri and for Nir and really the family that has pulled this all together, and Shaul as well, for treating me with such wonderful warmth and respect as well. Probably, quite frankly, taking me as a tired little bundle <laughs> in the last 48 hours or 36 hours from one place to the next to make sure I'm getting there. Uh, so thank you so much for providing this opportunity. Uh, and also a very special thank you to Sir Ronald Cohen. Now, I cannot express to you how thrilling it is and also how nerve wracking it is to speak just after you, to be fair. But I think you'll understand now, having heard Sir Ronald speak, that you know, he is the catalyst for so many of us to get involved in this space. Certainly for me, I can directly attribute my involvement in the space of sustainable and impact investing to your great work. So thank you for all that you do. It is not to be underestimated. So I suppose, as I mentioned, it's my first time in Tel Aviv, and, and I should probably start because in the past few hours I've realized the World Economic Forum uh, has a number of different interpretations and a number of different understandings of, of what we do and who we are. And just out of curiosity, a raise of hands, how many of you have heard of the World Economic Forum? All right, that's a good start. How many of you have heard of Davos? Okay, here we go. How many of you know what we do the other 51 weeks of the year? <laughs> Two hands. Three hands. Four hands, okay. I will be quizzing all of you, actually. <laughs> so perhaps maybe that's a good place to start. So let me exactly start there, tell you a little bit about who we are, what we do, how we have become involved in impact investing, but also, most importantly, how we align with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So in a nutshell, it's really hard to describe what we do in a nutshell, but we'll give it an attempt. We are an international organization for public-private cooperation with our mission to, uh, committed to improving the state of the world. We are global, independent, impartial, future-oriented, and a truly multi-stakeholder platform for the world's leaders from business, government, civil society, and academia to come together and shape the future. We are interested in advancing solutions that have a positive outcome, that require the collaboration of multiple parties, cannot be solved by one party alone, that have been intractable for many years. If it was easy, it would be done. So we tend to deal with the not easy. And especially solutions that have the potential to change the future of the world with a positive outlook. And we see this future through the lens of what we call the fourth industrial revolution. Again, hands, anyone ever heard of this term? Fourth industrial revolution, there we go, okay. So this is one key passion that we share in the room today is the belief that technology will continue to change the world at a level that is hard, if not impossible, to predict, and that its scale, scope, speed, and complexity, uh, the transformation will be unlike anything humankind has ever experienced. But we'll get back to the Fourth Industrial Revolution a bit later. The practice that I lead uh, aims to mobilize our vast network to accelerate the systemic evolution from the short-term investment mindset 
to one that focuses on long-term investments and sustainable impact, therefore increasing the flow of capital into impactful investments. But to be clear, we are not evangelists for any one approach because we have to be very much understanding across different interests to be able to get our work done. We have to maintain that neutrality and that full understanding that there are multiple ways, if you will, to skin a cat. And yes, we do gather in the freezing cold village of Davos once a year in January. This to me, by the way, feels like summertime in Geneva, here in Tel Aviv. <laughs> Our annual meeting in this village of Davos is a high-level working meeting for dozens of different communities from around the world, all ages and sections of society. When Davos ends, however, our work continues on more than 65 year-round forum projects aimed at supporting the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So we do actually do something the other 51 weeks of the year. So we aligned very early to the 17 dimensions of the SDG framework to readily support this effort through our platform and projects. By 14 system initiatives, we tackle key facets of the SDGs through responsible production and consumption, clean energy, reducing inequality, and of course, long-term investing in development. We can do this most often by embodying the role of SDG number 17, building partnerships for the goals. Additionally, the forum brings a new dimension to the SDG agenda by applying this fourth industrial revolution lens, which has the potential to dramatically change the strategies at the country level for SDG planning and implementation. And so as a result, the forum serves as a partner to mobilize SDG country implementation by helping governments plan, resource, and implement their SDG country action plans. So this is one major reason we launched a meeting this last September in New York during the UN General Assembly Week called the Sustainable Development Impact Summit. So to offer that mechanism for public-private cooperation to jointly design accountable strategies for action plans. So now the link that we have to the SDGs is probably pretty clear. So I was asked today to talk about how impact investing is an ideal tool to achieve the SDGs. But actually, in witnessing the developments in the last two years at the global aggregate level, I actually question whether, in fact, it may be the other way around, to be fair. Haven't the SDGs been a valuable tool to coherently articulate global needs that inspire the private sector to take action? Does it matter, actually, what direction this takes as long as action is taken? This year, preparing for our 48th annual meeting, and under the theme of creating a shared future for a fractured world, there will be a presence of impact investing and sustainable investing, the likes of which I have never seen. And this is due in large part to the fact that our members are asking for SDG financing, impact investing, sustainable investment to be on the agenda. And I can tell you, this is a true change. This is a tremendous change. So let's talk for a second about the intersection of the SDGs and impact investing. Now, you're probably all quite sophisticated on the numbers that have been tossed around, but I think I'm here to also scare you anew, to remind you of the numbers one more time. The UN SDGs have roughly a $4 trillion annual financing need, of which less than half is currently funded. That equates to roughly $2.5 trillion in annual investment gap. Now, the consequences of not filling this gap are beyond critical on a number of dimensions, including global inequality, irreversible environmental degradation, and mass displacement of populations. And the capacity of the public sector and civil society to meet this shortfall is nearly impossible. So the private sector has a huge role to play to fill this gap. So impact investing, which we're gonna hear many, much about today, is part of this innovative toolkit of financing approaches and mechanisms that can attract new sources of capital. Blended finance, for example, leverages donor funding as first lost capital to allow private capital as well to enter into investments that they would deem otherwise too risky or unfamiliar. As a tool, it can be quite catalytic if done well, which is why we actually also launched our own platform on blended finance called Sustainable Development Investment Partnerships, or platform, sorry. But blended capital is not an answer in and of itself because projects need to stand on their own two feet without subsidy. Subsidy from concessionary capital providers will find it difficult to last the long term. And the tech world is currently not largely served by this mechanism. Now, sustainable investing is also catching the SDG bug through environmental, social, and governance-weighted investments 
that are now regularly outperforming traditional investments, which is a great sign, really fantastic sign. This is also good news because there's about $290 trillion in assets under management by pension funds, insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds, and other foundations. Let's let that marinate for a second. $290 trillion in assets under management. And we're talking a billion, probably around 250 billion at the moment, conservative estimate around impact investing. There's quite a gap. There's a lot of capital out there. But we're not yet at the position where we can actually have institutional investors deploying fully into the space. It's a lot of capital and there are a lot of products that we'll need to design to absorb investments at that scale. So impact investing is a fantastic answer. The investment mindset and the focus on business model viability are what make impact investing such an incredible tool for the SDGs. And it's actually quite new for the development financing space. It opens up the aperture to deliver positive impact when, it's some, when some would call it an unusual bedfellow. Private capital is an unusual bedfellow, but it is incredibly nimble and risk tolerant. The field has seen tremendous growth in the last 10 years, much of which uh, the initial skepticism with financial viability is starting to wane. A recent Global Impact Investing Network survey reported that 98% of surveyed investors said that their performance expectations had been exceeded and a further 91% also earned more money than expected. These reports are getting the attention of asset owners and asset managers across the world and allowing them to take risks in order to invest with values in play. So as you'd likely hear over and over again, we've already heard it many times, really the millennial gener generation is the wind beneath the wings of this field and an appetite for responsible action has never been seen before. But another trend, it's very helpful actually, in the moment is that volatility in short-term markets is making many generations invest with a long-term view. That's actually quite helpful as well. But what I'm truly excited about, like many of you, is the intersection of technology impact investing in the SDGs, as tech is and always has been a highly attractive and tran uh, translatable investment opportunity. And the potential scale of tech-related impact investments shows promise towards addressing many of these key challenges. So the time really is now for the merger of the two, but I won't be the first to warn against this as well. There's a term called SDG washing that you would all be very familiar with and something that we are very concerned about in a sense as well. So with the term of SDGs reaching such buzzy proportions across the world, in order to maintain integrity along the path to success, investors and companies have to agree to be transparent and accountable with integrated reporting and a measurement of progress and impact, very much to what Sir Ronald was speaking about. So how can technology entrepreneurs and impact investors help us to achieve the SDGs? Like any good little consultant, I've got three thoughts. Speed, perspective, and leadership. You can help us achieve the SDGs by leveraging the speed of the fourth industrial revolution first and foremost. So the velocity, scope, and systems impact of the fourth industrial revolution has no historical precedent. It is disrupting almost every industry in every country and transforming entire systems of production, management, and governance. The potential to create positive social and environmental impact will be multiplied by emerging technology breakthroughs in fields such as artificial intelligence, robotics, biotechnology, the internet of things, 3D printing, and energy storage. Why is this relevant? I hate to remind you, but I believe that's my role here that there is a time limit on achieving the sustainable development goals. So whilst the speed of fourth industrial revolution is overwhelming, it also holds the potential to solve problems at an unprecedented pace, as long as we stay on the pulse and harness its implicit opportunities, opportunities and minimize its risks. But thus far, those who have gained most from the fourth industrial revolution have been consumers, able to afford and access the digital world and not those that are in the greatest need for basic products and services. So I urge you to think ahead and make the speed of the fourth industrial revolution work for them, as well as your solutions and your investments. Take, for example, the application of technologies like blockchain, coupled with sensors and data tags that are enabling companies to provide verified information about the materials, processes, and people behind products. Although still in its infancy, traceability is critical for many things, building trust, ensuring fair earnings for producers and suppliers, 
and shining a light on critical areas of inequality and misallocation of scarce resources. And most importantly, traceability can help to mitigate the risk of this SDG washing by providing transparency that can enable such critical proof points as measurement and reporting of impact. So the second thought was perspective. Help us achieve the SDGs through perspective by engaging in systems level thinking and action. Technology is not sector bound, you know this. And thus it forces us to understand our effect on the impact on systems around us and to learn from other applications of similar underlying technologies. Taking a systems approach opens up the opportunity for efficiency gains by learning and investing in models that work elsewhere and replicating them in areas where their value can be exponential. As you already know, innovation doesn't have to mean new. As an example, in advanced agriculture, increased demand on land and water for feedstock for manufacturing helps make agri-food systems a cross-sector issue. The greatest source of innovation can be found in precision and automated agricultural biotech, where the Internet of Things, data and analytics are coupled with crop science to optimize farming decisions on everything from fertilizer and irrigation to harvesting and speed, uh, seed spacing. Advances drive substantial yield gains with planning. This could help avoid food scarcity. So go ahead and zoom out. Look across the metaphorical fence to see where solutions and investments can have a systems level impact on the SDGs. So lastly, leadership. Let's solve the SDGs through leadership in creating a shared future with enhanced collaboration towards agile governance. Regulatory frameworks, innovation programs, and private, public private cooperations are known to be key catalysts necessary to accelerate the pace of innovation. But how long can governance keep up with the speed of the fourth industrial revolution? And how nimble is governance to adapt to its ever-changing needs? Current models of governance fundamentally clash with the pace of change, and new technologies are putting enormous pressure on existing regulatory frameworks. Innovative approaches to policy and governance are needed to facilitate the adoption of new technologies in a positive and inclusive way. But this is not only the realm of policymakers. Increased collaboration within the public, or within and between public and private sectors is essential to ensure multi-stakeholder participation in the sustainable development investments and for accelerated deployment of available technologies, solutions, and business models. So may, as you may have heard recently, we actually just launched as well a center for the fourth industrial revolution in San Francisco with the mission of co-designing the innovation governance protocols and policy frameworks needed to maximize the benefit of science and technology while minimizing their risks to society. All of us are responsible for guiding this evolution in the decisions we make on a daily basis as entrepreneurs and as investors. Long gone are the days when we could afford to deflect responsibility for our actions. And while individual efforts shouldn't be overlooked, the scale that is achieved from working together is undeniable. This brand of leadership last year was actually referred to by my chairman, Professor Klaus Schwab, as responsive and responsible leadership. So I'll wrap things up now, actually, with a quote from Professor Schwab on this concept of responsible and responsive leadership. He says, when you're a leader, you need to, ma to maintain two things to navigate the course of your organization. First, a radar, so you know what's going on around you and you can avoid obstacles that pop up. This is responsive leadership. Without it, you end up in a ditch sooner than later. Second, you need a compass so you know where you're going. This is responsible leadership. Without it, you get lost. And in today's world, both are essential. So to my mind, many of these successes from the last years in bringing impact investing in the SDGs to the forefront of the global conversation stem from strong and dedicated players who work together through partnerships and collaboration and are driven by these sturdy radars and compass. So I encourage all of you here in the Israeli tech entrepreneurship scene and investors as well to be leaders in sustainable and durable social impact and to be responsible and responsive in all that you do to, as we double down to achieve the global goals. Toda Raba, thank you for your attention and enjoy the conference. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you. Um, I want to say thank you firstly for your leadership and for creating the space 
for these conversations to emerge. I love the fact that you started off by saying, here's what we do outside Davos. Um, and I also really resonated with the fact that there's a lot of impact investing going to be happening at Davos this year, and, and you are creating the space for this to happen. So thank you. Um, I have one question for you. Um, I'm sure in the room today there are a lot of people who feel that um, they've got technologies or they've got ideas that they would love to be part of the conversation that you're having, mm. like the conversations that happen at Davos. And, and they feel that it's, kind of, it's over there with the rich, important people, and we're over here, and we're just, we're just the entrepreneur. How, how do we connect those two so that we're getting the value of everybody's energies and ideas coming into that conversation? So I would actually start by saying you'd, you'd probably be surprised by who is with us in Davos and in a lot of our meetings that there is, there is actually quite a lot of direct touch point to what's happening in various ecosystems around the world and especially when it comes to innovation. Our members are so fascinated by what you are capable of and sitting there really quite eagerly waiting to hear news of technologies and solutions that are coming up into the world that they can actively back that they can support in, in many, many ways. So you'd be interested when, when we have these meetings, they'll stand up and say, well, I, I was just in Tel Aviv, for example, as an investor, as a corporate, and I heard all of these different things. Sorry? Yes, absolutely. We have a regional meeting in Africa every year. Absolutely. And all of our members will come into those meetings, those regional meetings. We have eight, by the way, regional meetings. And they will stand up and say, I've just heard from this entire ecosystem, from this energy, conferences like this provide our members opportunities to come into that setting and to bring in directly the ideas that you're working on into that conversation. And then to allow us to then go back and say, ooh, that, that seemed to really touch a nerve. Let's bring that into the fold and find out who in the world is actually working on that specific solution so we can elevate that topic. So you'd be surprised at how the information does actually filter and elevate into these global conversations on this social impact topic. Fabulous. So I think the, the message there is keep talking, people. Keep shouting. Actually, importantly, keep doing as well. Keep doing. <laughs> we can all talk a lot. Thanks,